To be honest with somebody and say, I screwed up about something, I ended up in debt because of it, that's a really vulnerable thing to do. So if you, as the other party, makes a face, makes a snide comment, looks horrified, you're really fracturing trust in this vulnerable moment. This show is dedicated to helping you strengthen your family tree and live financially free. Welcome to the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, everybody. This is Andy Hill, and today we're talking about dealing with a money imbalance in marriage. This money imbalance can be everything from one spouse earning more than the other spouse to one spouse spending much more than the other spouse. When these types of imbalances exist, resentment and tension can grow in relationships. So to help us to navigate this marriage and money situation, I've invited author Aaron Lowry back to the show again. Aaron is an award-winning writer, speaker, and the author of the Broke Millennial series, which includes her latest book, The Broke Millennial Workbook, Take control and get your financial life together. When Erin isn't supporting couples with their marriage and money questions, she's enjoying her home in New York City with her husband and their rambunctious dog. Welcome back to the show, Erin. So wonderful to be back here. Absolutely. Well, you know what? You've did you did such a great job the last two times. We got to do number three, get right? Get that hat trick in. Come on. That's right. Hat trick. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's talk about income first when it comes to this money imbalance in marriage. How would you define an income imbalance in marriage, Erin? I feel like the traditional answer of one person earning more than the other is a pretty easy way to lay it up. But I think we can also think beyond that. One, obviously, if one person has left the workforce for whatever reason and the other is continuing to earn, that can create a massive power imbalance in a relationship. But the other thing is also benefits. Like That's one that we don't think about a lot, where mm-hmm. like in my household, I financially out earn my husband, but I'm self-employed and he has all the good benefits. So at the end of the day, there is also like an interesting structure there as well. And let me tell you, when you're thinking about like life insurance and estate planning, that stuff really comes into play too. Don't just think about the income number. It's really about the whole picture. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, so I guess over time, if we're looking at these imbalances, whether it's benefits or income, What issues can arise uh, in relationships? One of the biggest sources of tension is obviously the dynamic of the person who earns more feeling as if they have more power or control over how money is handled in the household, or especially saying anything along those lines. Like, well, I earn this amount, therefore I get to make X, Y, Z decision, or therefore I believe we should be doing A, B, C. That's creating a completely toxic dynamic in a relationship really no matter what stage you're in. So whether it's we're just dating and we don't live together, we don't, you know, we haven't moved in, we haven't gotten married, we don't have kids, but the one person who earns more is constantly making all of the choices, even if they're always picking up the tab, that still is creating a balance or an imbalance in the relationship dynamic that's really unhealthy that early on. Now, once you kind of kick it down the road, The big thing is to think that everything is in seasons of life, right? Like we never know what's going to happen. And to set up a system where just because you're the earner, you get to be making choices is pretty dangerous because it could easily flip on you at some point where the other person is out earning. Absolutely. Yeah. I I can think of uh, multiple times in my 13 year marriage where my wife has earned more than I have. And then I've earned more than she has at certain points. And yeah, if if we were to decide one person has the power from, from the start to the finish, then and uh, this, this whole, this, this would not have worked very well, I guess we'll say. It's also just it's not a-, a healthy system to set up. Like no one should ever have the quote unquote power because of a, you know, whether it's I earn more money or I have more access to X, Y, Z resource. Like there should be a partnership. Will things always be equal? No, because that's just not how life works. But at the end of the day, you hope it shakes out to feel equal. Yeah. And and it's not just uh, income and benefits, too. It can also be what you bring into the relationship as well. Uh, Let's talk about debt. I remember I remember getting into my marriage and I brought a boatload of debt into our relationship and my wife, not so much. So talk to us about the dynamics of starting a marriage or starting a relationship with that imbalance in how much debt you're bringing in. Yeah, and that's also an interesting one is there can be a high earner who also has high debt. Like let's think about somebody who's in a relationship where one of them is perhaps a doctor and ended up with, let's say, $200,000 of student loan debt. So even if they're earning $300,000, 
those are big numbers. And when it comes to debt, so same as your situation, my husband brought debt into our marriage as well. I knew about it years and years and years in advance. It was a very common conversation we would have about how we would handle debt when we got married. He had a little over $50,000 worth of student loans when we got married. For me, the one thing I talk about a lot is this idea that debt should not be the deal breaker for anyone. Please, before you even get engaged, have the get financially naked conversation. Please share all of the ins and outs of your financial situations because you are signing a commitment to another person. Like This is also a legally binding contract when you sign that marriage license. So make sure you know what you're in for, first of all. But the other big part, too, is the existence of debt to me is never the problem. The how it was incurred should be a conversation, but the is there a cycle? Is there a trigger? Is there something that keeps happening time and time again? That's where there can be red flags. So is this person always accumulating credit card debt, paying it off in a decent clip, but then still accumulating it again? The behavior there is more concerning than, hey, my partner has $100,000 in student loan debt and a $10,000 auto loan. Those are painful numbers, but those are very different situations than my partner has seven grand of credit card debt, paid it off, but now has $3,000 of credit card debt. Again, can't seem to really take control of that situation. And even if it is credit card debt, the question is, what did it come from? Let's talk medical debt in this country. I mean, it is crazy how often people end up in credit card debt because of something that's completely outside of their control. So again, having the conversation about how, and then also what's the plan to get rid of it. Those are the real key factors here. Yeah, let, let's let's move over to that. Let's talk about the, the remedy to the situation because there's going to be an imbalance. It's never going to be equal, perfectly equal, right? I mean, give me a break. That's just, it's just not reality. So what do we need to do if we feel this uh, tension, if we feel this, you know, separation of either income or debt brought into the marriage or spending this imbalance, what do we need to do to start remedying the situation? Well, the big thing is to talk about it. Right? Like you need to address the elephant in the room. And if there is resentment, first identifying in yourself why. Like, what are you resenting about the other person having that debt? And be a little careful with how you talk about it with your partner. You don't want to come in kind of like guns blazing, be like, I resent you for having XYZ debt and the fact that we got married. And especially if you didn't know about it, I didn't know about it. You know, there's. It really needs to be more of a safe space conversation, which I know even that term for people can sometimes be like, okay. But I say that because talking about money is hugely vulnerable in any stage of your life. And especially if you've made a mistake, to be honest with somebody and say, I screwed up about something. I ended up in debt because of it. That's a really vulnerable thing to do. So if you, as the other party, makes a face, makes a snide comment, looks horrified. You're really fracturing trust in this vulnerable moment. So I always advise a poker face anytime we're having these conversations. And if you need to take a beat, walk away. That's the other part. I think sometimes we're conditioned to be like, finish the conversation, have it out till there's a conclusion. These conversations can get really tense. And if you're really not having any sort of productive communication, take a breath, separate for a little bit, it could be a couple of days later you come back to it. And if you consistently cannot have a healthy conversation, bring in a neutral third party. Certified financial planner could be a great option. A financial therapist could be a good option. Couples counselor, depending on what the actual problem is, could be a good option. I wouldn't make it a parent or a friend or a coworker. Like it really should be somebody that neither of you are particularly connected to and has some level of specialty in this. Yeah, I think that those are those are great pieces of advice. One thing that popped out to me is the ability to and the and just remembering that walking away obviously and and taking a breath and taking a beat in between is okay. I think for so long I prided myself as somebody in a relationship or just in communication in general, like, let's hash this out. Let's get this done. But my wife, my wife is the opposite. Like, I need a breather, man. Like, you can't just keep jamming it down and then like, eventually it'll be solved. It doesn't work like that. So uh, over time, uh, I've got 13 years and counting, I'm still learning that, uh, that uh, yeah, people operate differently and you need to be able to learn that about your spouse and your partner and be able to move forward. Uh, one other thing you talked about uh, right there is just that people don't, 
I guess I don't want to say people in general, but a lot of people don't like talking about money. And it ends up being that thing that is just feels taboo or wrong to talk about. Why is that? I know you and I have been talking about that for about five or six years now, Aaron. But why, what is going on? What, why is that so ingrained in our society that this is a taboo topic to talk about? I know you didn't grow up like that. I know I didn't grow up like that. But why... Why is it so? Why is it so prevalent in our society? And I would say we're probably the weirdos in that dynamic. Yes, we're weird. Yeah, and <laughs> I want to say it's so tied into judgment at the end of the day. Like ultimately, money conversations comes down to a fear of being judged by somebody else, and whether that's being judged for the amount of money that you make, the amount of debt that you have, the choices that you've made, what's in your retirement account, how you choose to spend your money, like. All of that ultimately really comes down to judgment. And yes, it's easy to say like, oh, just decide what you value and then focus your income there. And like, yeah, a fundamentally great advice. Also really hard to do. And it's also very hard to do because society tries to tell us what we should and shouldn't value. And if you at all push back against societal norms in a particular space, that can be really hard. Like for me. Uh, for those who are watching, I don't wear a traditional engagement ring, wedding ring. I didn't have an engagement ring. I do have a gold band that I wear, but I rock a silicone ring like 85% of the time. And when I first had a conversation with my, before he was my fiance, now husband, where I was like, I really don't want you to waste money on an engagement ring. And he was like, I'm sorry, what now? And I'm like, it's just not a piece of jewelry that I would wear. And that's not a shot. I mean, I have a lot of feelings about the whole history of them, but it, it's not a shot at people who choose to wear them. It's just like, it's just not my style. So why would we spend this much money on something that's not my style? I'd rather have a nice watch, quite frankly. Like, that's more my style. And the amount of conversations we had to have and also the amount of kind of defending the choice in that season of my life I had to be making when we would say, oh, we're engaged and people would grab my hand and there was nothing there. But his concern was too, like, that's going to be an indictment on him and his ability mm. to buy it, not just my choice to not want it. So again, all of this comes back to judgment and the concern yes. about how people are going to perceive us. And that's just a tiny example, this one moment in our life that was just a season, because then after we got married, I had a gold band on and I wear it, but still, it's not a diamond ring. So sometimes people still have questions or comments or whatever. And it just all comes up. What car do you drive? What house do you live in? Do you have kids? How many? Where do they go to school? What kind of vacations do you take? Like everything is constantly a judgment. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes back to a lot of, uh, I guess, what you could call traditional values, maybe that have been in our society for hundreds of years or not even, I, mean, I know this is a, um, a marketing campaign that you and I are talking about with regard to the ring and the diamond and everything like that. That might not even be a hundred years, but it's been something in our our tradition and in our in our country for for a long time. Another thing that has been a tradition in marriages is that joint bank account. You know, when we talk about a money imbalance sometimes in a relationship, maybe the joint bank account could be more of a con than a pro. Can you talk about maybe some alternatives to joint bank accounts if couples are finding themselves in that money imbalance situation and they want a little bit more autonomy with the money? Yeah. You know, especially when you get married, you just kind of default to what everybody else does on certain things. And joint banking is a really common one that, you know, you're not really married unless you have a joint bank account and you don't trust <laughs> each other unless you have a joint bank account. There's all sorts of rhetoric around it please just do what makes the most sense for the two of you. Like it really needs to be about your relationship ecosystem. I personally love the hybrid model, sometimes called a yours, mine and ours model, where for us, what we do is most of the money goes into one pot. And from that pot, we pay bills, we put money into investments, we save for the future. And these are all goals that we've, as a team, agreed upon. But then both of us have one individual checking account that's just in our names that we get, because I do not have a better term for this, an allowance. Again, mm. don't have a better, fun money, blow money, autonomy. spend money. Yeah, yeah. like it really just is autonomy. <laughs> and again, this can come back to an imbalance in how much you earn. For some people, there's this desire to like prorate based on earning, which again, I think is a dangerous game. We again, mm. do not earn the same amount of money, but we get the same amount when it comes to our autonomy money, our fun money every single month. 
And that number has shifted based on other priorities for us. You know, if we're in a really high season of saving, we're going to reduce how much we get for fun money. So that's also something we check in on is, does this feel like enough? And that fun money gives us kind of a pressure release valve for, well, one, if you're trying to buy presents for the other person, it makes life a lot easier oh. for one. But also if there's, you know, like a big thing that I want to splurge on or that he wants to splurge on, we're able to save up in that account too. And it's never a, you really spend that much money on that thing? Because again, coming back to values, we don't value the exact same things. And I don't want to be nitpicking at every little thing that he's spending money on and vice versa, particularly if we're in a, like a high season of saving or investing or aggressively trying to do something. It becomes very easy to be like, really, you bought lunch out today? Why did we buy like the turkey wrap stuff if you're just going to keep buying lunch out at school? Where <laughs> if you've got money that you can spend however you want, great. I'm not going to nag you about it and vice versa. Yeah, I think this is a good conversation. You talk about, you know, maybe... Um people don't know about these different terms or yours, mine, and ours or different ways, but this is where they can learn or find out their own way of, of doing these things. Cause we've heard about joint accounts for so long. Now there's not anything wrong with that at all. If that works for you, as you're saying, keep, keep at it, but there are other ways to slice this. And just because it's been a tradition for a really long time, doesn't mean you can't make your own version of things. And yep. the way banking apps are set up now and FinTech, it just gets so much easier with how, how these are all set up and, you can create your own version, right? You can. And also you should constantly, well, constantly is a heavy word, every couple of months, check in, obviously on your goals and how things are working, but also make sure that you're checking in on how does your system work for you? Because it could also be that in a particular season of life where maybe things were less stressful, having a more complicated system worked. But as things change over time, it might be like, simplify, simplify, simplify. Like this is a lot. You know, I'll be totally frank. We've been married for almost five years and there are still checking accounts that we each brought into the marriage that neither of us really use. But I'm like, we just keep putting it off closing and consolidating <laughs> because it's just like on the ever growing to do list. But we're kind of reaching a season of life. Where I'm like, oh, we just need to sit down for like two days straight and get all this done because it's just becoming tedious every single month when we're working our budget and sending money where we want to send money. So be sure to reevaluate. And also maybe you're a couple who does joint for a while and switches to hybrid or goes hybrid and then decides to move over to joint. There's also nothing wrong with that. And maybe you're also a couple, it's like, hey, for whatever reason in our ecosystem, we're completely siloed. Everything is 100% separate. And just make sure that there's a lot of communication around who's paying what bills, making sure everything is getting handled and everything still feels fair and equitable for your dynamic. Let, let's talk to somebody who's listening right now and they're saying, yeah, you know, I clicked on this episode because I'm feeling a little money imbalance in my relationship. And I kind of like the idea of maybe a yours, mine and ours or just a different way of handling our finances in general, but they're really nervous to chat with their spouse because they hate talking about money. This spouse does not want to talk about money at all. Can you give them some advice uh, to broach this conversation in the easiest way possible? Honestly, share this episode. You know, I, I don't say it flippantly. <laughs> I think sometimes the easiest way to talk about money with somebody else is to give them a resource that's not you talking to them about money. And yeah. that can be an inspiration or just like, hey, I listened to this, or have you ever read about this? Or have you ever heard people talk about this particular area of personal finance? That can be super powerful. Or just ask a really open-ended question. Hey, I was listening to a podcast recently and I heard them talk about the idea of yours, mine, and ours accounts. And this is what they are. And how does that make you feel? Would that be something you think would work for us? And just see what they say. Not, hey, we've been having a lot of problems with this particular thing, and I think this maybe will solve the problem. Like, don't go negative with a potential solution. Just ask how they would feel about it. You know, for me, when I brought up a prenup for the first time, I did it before we were even engaged. And it was just a, how do you feel about prenups? Like, it was not a, I would like a prenup. You have to sign a prenup. It was, mm. this isn't even an issue yet. I want to know how you feel about them because I'm willing to bet you have an opinion that's informed by what I think is a toxic understanding of what prenups are. Obviously, I didn't say that last yeah. part. We just slowly got into it over time. Yeah, I think that's great. And, and a big part of 
having that more gentle conversation or just like leading into it instead of, you know, saying, hey, we need to talk about this. The way we're doing it sucks. You know, you need to we need to fix this now is carving out that time for those conversations. I know as busy entrepreneurs, as busy workers, as busy employees, as busy parents, uh, married people that we run out of time real fast. So we have to start making that time or carving that in our schedule for these big conversations, because if we keep putting it off, it's just going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. Can we talk about that a little bit? I'm sure you've had some conversations with couples or people out there that have just put this stuff off and it just festers and gets worse. Talk, talk to us about that because if we don't have these conversations, these important conversations, what happens, Aaron? Well, I mean, if you never have them, you're going to hit a crisis point in some way, shape or form. Like something big will happen that will force a problem that maybe could have been mitigated if you had the conversation earlier. And a big thing that I love to bring as a suggestion to these moments is a concept of temptation bundling. So it's something you don't want to do, but let's combine it with something you do want to do. Mm. And that can just make the whole thing a little bit more palatable for both parties. If you both know that maybe both of you don't like talking about money, like not even just with each other, it's just something that's uncomfortable. What's something you really enjoy? Maybe it's particular takeout that you only indulge in every once in a while. Maybe it's making a certain meal. Maybe it's you get to watch a certain show afterwards. I wouldn't always bring alcohol into the situation. Like sometimes it's, you know, open up your favorite bottle of wine, but also maybe that's not productive for a heavy conversation. Maybe that's for an after the conversation, but bringing in something that you do actually enjoy with it. The only caution, I wouldn't go to your favorite restaurant. Like I just really wouldn't do this in public because mm. again, if things get a little tense, that's a very awkward thing to be doing publicly and trying to control your emotions in that setting. Also, if you have roommates around, even if you have kids, if it's something that you feel like is going to be really tense, is there an opportunity that maybe you can have them go to their grandparents or have the opportunity to have this conversation when they're on a play date or just something so that even children aren't around? Because waiting till they go to bed, it's the end of your day, you might be really tired, you're just wanting to get the conversation over with. So trying to control for making it as happy an environment as you possibly can going into a conversation that might not be the best. Yeah, I think that's great. And and oftentimes uh, early on in our marriage, when we had very young kids, I would make the mistake of having some of these important conversations uh, while we were busy doing other things, whether that's uh, cooking or, you know, cleaning the house or kids are hanging on our legs. And I'd be like, Hey, by the way, uh, you know, we, we, we got to figure out this, uh, this, this mortgage, this next mortgage, next mortgage payment, you know, it, it would just be always the wrong time. It'd be like, okay, try to wait until there's a calm moment, especially if it's a tense conversation about what can be in our society, a very tense conversation about money and especially money imbalances in relationships. Aaron, I know you talk about all of this stuff in your new book called Broke Millennial Workbook, Take Control and Get Your Financial Life Together. Tell us more about it and where people can connect with you more. Well, the workbook is actually a workbook. I know some people are like, what does that mean? Do I have to buy the other ones? No, it totally stands on its own. I will also say the third book, Broke Millennial Talks Money, very heavily gets into this, these conversations as well. But the workbook really was inspired by the original book, and it sets you up to actually have to pick up a pen or a pencil and write down information and go look up your numbers, and it talks you through how to create an attack plan on things like paying off your debt, handling your student loans, your emotional relationship to money, which is a huge one. Also, speaking of that, a big question to ask your partner at some point is how does money make you feel? Because that can give you a lot of insight as to why your partner might be reacting certain ways to things that you're like, I don't understand why this is a big deal. So making sure you understand that about your partner as well. So Broke Millennial Workbook, it's interactive and makes you actually dig into the muck. Reading books are great, but taking action is even better. So I'm trying to really encourage you to take that action and they're available wherever books are sold. I love that. You made such a good point there. I think a lot of people blame money or or uh, you know, money as the problem for relationship issues. That's just the tool. I think a lot of problems come from these deeper conversations or the emotions around money. And so when we dive into that a little further, we can uncover some important things that could potentially help you really grow in your relationship. Aaron's talking all about this. Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you and thanks for having me back. 